I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. That's a real nice psalm. I think we've all learned, many of us have heard that since the time we were children. Some of us memorized it. And it's very encouraging. But what I want to share with you today, when David penned this psalm, he was in the valley of the shadow of death. And, and this psalm for David was an encouragement. I mean, it sounds nice to us, you know. I'm in green pastures and, and the, God's rod and his staff comfort me and he prepares a table and all this stuff. But we need to realize that when David wrote this, he was in the valley. Scripture, it says he was walking in the valley of the shadow of death. He was not in a good place. And David was using this time, this thing that we read now, he was using this as an encouragement to himself because there was no one else to encourage him. He was walking in the valley of the shadow of death. So, so when, I, when I'm reading these stories, these Bible stories, Scripture tells us that whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of Scripture might have hope. But, but in order for us to get that comfort and that patience, of scripture, patience from Scripture, we must truly identify with the characters that we're reading about. We have to understand what they're going through or we won't really get anything from it. So, so when I look at David here, I see David as a warrior king. And, and he's in a place of deep depression right now. He says he's walking through the valley. So he's not running. He's not frolicking or skipping. He's walking through the valley, which means he's in there for the long haul. He's in a valley. And we know what a valley is. A valley is a place of depression, a, a place of oppression, a very negative place. For David being a warrior, a valley is a very poor strategic place to be in. You want to be on high ground. If you're on high ground, you can fire down on your enemy. If you're in the valley, you can't charge up a hill without getting shot. You can't fire up that hill. He knows as a warrior, that's a very poor strategic place to be. David is walking in a terrible place in his life. And he's saying in the shadow, the shadow of death, the shadow is a darkness. The shadow is something that blocks out light. The shadow is something that blocks out understanding, enlightenment, or even happiness. This is where David is right now, in the shadow of death. And death may not be normal or regular death, but it's, it's a negativity. It's an oppression. I'm sure all of us have felt from time to time something negative. So when we read the 23rd Psalm, understand what David is going through right now. He's going through one of the worst times of his life. But in the worst times of his life, what David is doing is he's learned to encourage himself. And so we say in scripture, we see that even in his life when he was a young boy, when he went to fight the giant Goliath. If you recall that story, when he was charging Goliath, he was saying, you know, there was a lion that attacked my daddy's sheep and I slew the lion. There was a bear that attacked my father's sheep and I slew the bear and that's how I'm going to slay, slay, slay you too. But we need to comprehend how David is even encouraged. You think that little boy wasn't afraid when he was facing that giant? He was probably scared to death like any of us would be. But, but he knew how to encourage himself. He learned that at a young age. And we see now, even as David, as an older man here, he's learned to encourage himself. Yea, that I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Look around, even here this morning. Many right now are living in the valley of the shadow of death. Many of your friends, some of you might be as well. This morning, I'm on a mission I'm on a divinely mandated mission. My mission is to go in and bring some of you out of the darkness that you're in right now. My mission is to go, my, my mission is to help some of you avoid a darkness that may already be on your horizon. And, and for some of you is to prepare you for a darkness that you may be forced to experience. So let's pray real quick. Father, we just come to you in Jesus' name. Father, we are your children. We're just, we're trying to survive. And, and we go through things and sometimes we just don't know which way to go, which way to turn. Father, I pray, Father, this day that you take, take the me out of me. Fill me afresh with your spirit. Open my eyes of understanding. Tune my ears so that I might hear your voice clearly, Father. And the same thing for these, my brothers and my sisters, so they might hear your word as well. Speak to us this day, Lord. Give us a word today so that we might have the strength, have the ability, just have the will to continue and find our way out of whatever situation we might be in or whatever situation we might be in in the future, Father. This we pray and we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Viktor Frankl was an American, was an Austrian neurologist psychiatrist who spent three years in various Nazi concentration camps, including Dachau and Auschwitz. He lost everything. He lost his family. He lost his wealth. He lost his business. 
He lost everything, but he survived. And the key to his survival, he states in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, is they can take everything from you, but they can't take your attitude. Okay? You can lose a good attitude, but it cannot be taken from you. So this morning, we're here to take control of our attitudes. The underlying theme today is that perception is greater than reality. Perception is greater than reality. In other words, how you view a situation, how you view others, how you view yourself is more influential in your life than reality. In other words, we are moved by what we believe than what has actually happened or what will happen. This is very important because we're so hardly ever moved by conscious thought. Rather, experiences through our lives dictate how we think and how we live. There are times that the catalyst to the motivations to our success, but unfortunately too often they are the reasons why we also fail. Relationships, bad relationships, health issues, lack of success are all due to unhealthy perceptions of a thing, a situation, and most influential, how we are perceiving ourselves, our self-perception. What is self-perception? How you view yourself for real. Now, not the image that you're projecting to the folks around you, but how you really view yourself. That's what self-perception is. Self-perception is the result of a subconscious measuring up of you to other people, other things, and other situations. And fear is the product of self-perception. Fear. Sadness, gladness, joy, peace of mind, healing, not getting healed, all are products of self-perception. This is why Jesus in Mark 9, 23 reveals when he said to the man whose son was sick, if you can believe, if you can only believe, all things are possible. As children of God, the answer is simply that we must begin to see ourselves as God sees us. And that is my daily prayer for me to begin to see myself as you see me. Sometimes to understand a spiritual principle, it's useful to use a natural analogy. So, so what is beautiful? What is beauty? Are you beautiful? Why do you feel you're beautiful? Or why do you feel you're not beautiful? We've heard that beauty is only skin deep, but it's not skin deep. It's exactly the opposite. Beauty goes deep into the psyche of an individual where self-perception is created. So, so why is it we struggle with beauty? Because of how we perceive ourselves. We know our flaws. Other folks don't know us like we know ourselves. And deep inside, we believe our self-perceptions. Spirituality is the same. We can convince the world how spiritual we are, spiritual giants. But we know our own weaknesses, our bents, our proclivities, our spiritual frailties, and our spiritual failures. And this is what we'll have to come clean with today because there will be no healing under a mask. There'll be no real successes under a mask. And there'll be no fulfilling relationships under a mask. Jesus said that it is the truth that will make us free. This is going to be an uplifting message, okay? <laughs> okay. But first we have to, it's like a doctor has to determine what the problem is before it can be fixed. I'm not perfect, I'm just forgiven. How many times have we heard that? How many times have we said that? So what does that mean, I'm not perfect, I'm just forgiven? What it does not mean is that we are not supposed to try to be better. In other words, although we are forgiven in our imperfection, Jesus tells us to be perfect. Is this a contradiction to grace? No. Perfect translates to mature. Be mature. Maturing is evolving perfection. Okay, I'm, I'm still not perfect. What does evolving perfection mean? A baby, for example, is perfect. When you're feeding the baby, mothers, grandmothers, dads like me will know this. When you're feeding a little baby and they're looking at, up at you, staring at you with those innocent, piercing eyes. You know what I'm talking about? That look when you're feeding them that Bible, that bottle that baby gives you. That's perfect. Little fingers, little toes. Little nose, little kissable forehead. Perfect. <laughs> but not before too long, there's an odor. Not perfect, right? Not perfect, but not perfect. Babies. At each stage in a child's life, still perfect, but their perfer perfection is evolving with maturity. When a toddler no longer soils a diaper, perfect. 
but breaks things. They are perfect for their age, but they're not perfect. Suppose a 32-year-old man is still soiling his diaper because he feels he doesn't have to be perfect to be forgiven and loved. He looks his age, and if his diaper is changed often enough, no one can know how stinky he is. But he can't leave home for long periods of time. So he can't work. He can't go to school. He can't participate in the simplest of man tasks as his diaper constantly requires changing. What profit is he to his family or his community? He's perfect in that he is a creation of God and loved by his family, but he has not matured. His perfection has not evolved. Don't get me wrong. We will never be perfect, perfect. And we are well with God. The Apostle Paul states in Romans, For the good which I would I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I practice. But if what I would not that I do, it is no more I that do it, but sin which dwells within you. What he's saying is, sometimes I know the things I should do when I don't do them. And, and then I do the things that I know I shouldn't do. But it's not me, it's the sin that dwells within me. And Paul also says that there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. We are well before God in our imperfections, but mandated by Jesus to strive for perfection, to mature with evolving perfection. Jesus said, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Second Chronicles 7.14, it speaks, the prophet is speaking to the troubled people of Israel who are suffering. He's speaking the heart of God to the people, and he says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and heal their land. When we take grace to mean that we haven't the responsibility to mature, in the wake of troubled times, we say things like, because they took the prayer out of schools, that's why things are messed up. Or, or it's the Muslim's fault, or it's the immigrant's fault, welfare recipients, whites or blacks. No, if my people, which are called by my name, would only mature, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. It's us not struggling to mature. How many times is a baby striving to walk, fall, and then get up and try again? Time after time. Why? How do we see ourselves? How does God see us? Pray to see yourself as God sees you. Today, we're going to quickly consider a short segment in the life of an Old Testament biblical character to get a better understanding of an erroneous self-perception, the consequences, and the remedy. In the book of 1 Samuel, the 30th chapter, David has been on the run from King Saul, who he loves as a dad figure. The prophet had informed King Saul that David would replace him as king one day. King Saul kind of loved David too, but his love for adulation and power overshadowed his love for David. And a time or two at a dinner table, King Saul tried to run David through with a spear. Some of y'all know this story. And, and was now in fact in pursuit of David, trying to kill him. 1 Samuel the 27th chapter, the first verse, and David said in his heart, I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me that I should escape speedily into the land of the Philistines. And Saul shall despair of me to seek me any more in any coast of Israel, so shall I escape out of his hand. And David arose, and he passed over with the six hundred men that were with him unto Achish, the son of Maok, king of Gath. And David dwelt with Achish at Gath, he and his men, every man with his household, even David with his two wives, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess and Abigail the Carmelitess, his wife. And it was told Saul that David was fled to Gath, and he sought no more again for him. And David said to Achith, If I have now found grace in your eyes, let them give me a place in some town in the country that I may dwell there. For why should this, thy servant dwell in the royal city with thee? Then Achish gave him Ziklag that day. Wherefore, Ziklag pertaineth unto the kings of Judah unto this day. So, so David was, he had a love feeling, a father love feeling to King Saul. King Saul betrayed him, tried to kill him, chasing him. Finally, David realized there was no hope and he went away. And he decided to stay with the Philistines. 
Now David, a child of Israel, anointed by the prophet Samuel, who killed Goliath. Goliath, by the way, was of Gath, of these same people that David was now trying to live with. David had won many battles. He knew God. He not only runs away, but he joins himself to the enemy of Israel and is given as a gift by the Philistine uh, leader a place to live, this place called Ziklag. Interesting about Ziklag, this city was promised to Israel, the tribe of Judah particularly, which David was over 200 years ago by Joshua as he was divvying up the land for the children of Israel. Now it seems that David is acquiring this land, but in the wrong way. Or is it? What is the meaning behind the name Ziklag? To press someone into giving up something. Describes laying siege to a city in order to force its surrender. It means distress, oppression, or pressure. There are, there are things that you can acquire that may seem best for you at the moment, but are not best for you in the long run. But the lessons learned can be very valuable. So David is now living with the enemy of his own people. This is David now. David has a word from God. See where we're going. David has a word from God. There is a destiny on David's life. His feet are being ordered of God, but he's trying to make his own way. And now he's living with the people that are an enemy of his own people. So now 1 Samuel 29th chapter. Now the Philistines gathered together all the armies to Aphek, and the Israelites pitched a fountain, which is in Jezreel. And the lords of the Philistines passed by hundreds and by thousands, but David and his men passed on the rear with Achish. So what's happening here is now is the monumental battle. Now is the battle between the Philistines and the children of Israel. They're getting ready to fight. And, and David is sneaking around the back of the Philistines so, so that he might join himself to the Philistines to fight against his own people. This is where David has come from. So he's not only living with the Philistines, now he's planning to join the men to fight with them against Israel. Song of Solomon speaks of the little foxes that spoil the vines. Things that might seem insignificantly wrong or justifiably wrong often lead to larger issues. In this case, David who merely sought refuge for his own life to stay alive with the enemy of his people is now ready to fight for the enemy against his people. Imagine that, how, how we allow issues to affect the paths that we're walking, to change the path, only to find later the path attached to that path is something a whole lot worse. That's where David is right now. So, so what I'm sharing with you today is this is how even when David wants to make this decision and he's complicating his life, God is still going to step in. So we, we find in the third verse that the princes of the Philistines got mad. He said, what are these Hebrews doing here? And Achish said to the princes of the Philistines, this is David. This is the guy that has been with me for so many years. He hasn't done me wrong. He's good. He's a good guy. He's going to fight with us. The leaders of the Philistines, the commanders are saying, no, he's not coming. Because in the midst of battle, David's going to change his mind, side with Saul, and try to ingratiate himself to his ex-master and kill us. Isn't this the guy that said, you know, Saul kills thousands and they said David kills ten thousands? So the leaders of the Philistines, even though the, the top guy liked David, he was wise enough to listen to his commanders, the counsel of his men. And he said, David, you know, you've done me well. You're a good man. But, but my commanders don't want you here, and this is a big battle, so you got to go. David tries to plead his case to Achish. He says, but what have I done, and what has thou found in the servant that I, have been, that I have done to you this day, that I may not fight against the enemies of my Lord? What we see in David here, he's got some daddy issues going on. When he was dealing with King Saul, you know, I don't know what his family life was with his dad. The Bible doesn't tell us. But, but evidently, he's feeling betrayed by King Saul. So he joins himself to the enemy of King Saul. That's how our kids will do that sometimes when they feel betrayed. They will. So, so now he joins himself to the enemy of King Saul. And now that, that man is saying, you can't come with me. And David is pleading with him, what have I done? A lot of times our motivations, remember, are not conscious motivations. We're being moved by subconscious proddings because of experiences that we've had in our lives. Challenge yourself. Judge yourself. Why, why do I keep sabotaging my successes? Why, why am I smoking cigarettes when I know that they cause cancer? Why am, I, why am I abusing this or abusing that? Why am I abusing my family when I know I really love my family? Why are we doing these things? Often there are subconscious proddings from situations and experiences from our past that are moving us to do things that really don't make any sense, that are destroying us. 
A little side note there. So anyway, the, the, the leader says, look, 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 David, you got to leave. My man, this is a big battle. It's too important. You got to go. In the morning, go back to Ziklag. So David agrees, okay? God will only allow you to go so far. And, and that's what God is doing here. It's obvious as I'm reading this that, that God will allow David to go so far into even his self-destruction because it is a path that God is leading him for a, a greater good. But God isn't allowing him to, to come against his plan, to fight his own people, to fight the children of Israel. Now, the enemy of God, how many knows there's an enemy of God? The enemy of God would love for David to fight on the side of the Philistines against Israel. The enemy of God would love that. But God isn't having it, and God has turned the hearts of the leaders of these Philistines to reject David, not to go with them in battle to fight against Saul to go back home. So, so David's going back home with his men. And, and, to, to, and, and so, so what, what we find here is a three-day journey, and when they get close to Ziklag, they see smoke in the distance. And, and as it turns out, while they were off over here trying to fight with the Philistines against Israel, the Amalekites had come down and attacked his home, Ziklag, had burned it to the ground, had taken all of the women, all of the sons, all of the daughters, all of the belongings of all of the men, David and all of his men, had taken them captive, taken them away. So when David and his men showed up, Ziklag was gone. This is what scripture says, 1 Samuel 30. And when it came to pass, when David and his men had come to Ziklag on the third day, the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and had smitten Ziklag and had burned it with fire and had taken captive all the women that were there. They didn't kill any, either great or small, but carried them away and went their way. So David and his men came to the city and behold, it was burned with fire and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captive. There are results from, from the actions that we take. David lost everything. So, so when we see these little uh, so, psalms like, like, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. That's where David is right now. And, and look at this. It said, it said, Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. Have you ever wept like that? to where you were just exhausted. That's where he was and his men. And David, David's two wives were taken captives. And David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him. His own men were going to kill him because of this mess that he had drugged them into. Because of the souls of the people were grieved, every man for his sons and their daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, And so how do we respond to depression if not dealing with it properly? Often by digging ourselves deeper and deeper. But David had to stand alone. His own men were talking of stoning him to death. There was no one for him. And this is when David finally came to his senses. David had to encourage himself. We, we have leaders, even in here this morning, religious leaders, community leaders, Leaders in classrooms, leaders over students, kids. We have leaders in families of families. As a caveat, a warning, when God has called you to lead, people will follow you, even in the wrong direction. Because, and when it blows up, they will turn on you, and rightly so. There is a responsibility on you as a leader to lead in the right direction. God will give you ample opportunity to turn around. But eventually, as we see here, God will step in and intervene. Now, this doesn't leave the followers off the hook. Followers have the responsibility to know right from wrong as well. Like the Berean church, which we're given to understand in Acts 17, were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, examining the scriptures daily, whether these things were so. It's a responsibility of everyone. Now, the end of the story is that David was able to rally his men, go down, and get his wives, their wives, their children, their sons, and all their belongings back. That's the end of the story. So, so what we're going we're gonna to look at, we're going to close with are the seven things that we can learn from David as we walk, as we walk through the valley 
of the shadow of death. Number one is that God will use circumstances to get your attention. So, so when you look and your situation is going awry, what I call walk it with your eyes open and just look. Jesus laments to the Pharisees. He kind of chastises them about how well they are looking at the sky and they can tell what the weather is going to be the next day, but they can't tell the sign of the times. They're the sign of the times in our lives all along. There, there are sicknesses. You know, sometimes we eat the wrong foods. So sometimes we don't take care of ourselves. And our body gives us signs all the time that there's something wrong, but we ignore those signs. God will use circumstances to get your attention. If I'm driving my car and the engine light comes on, I'm going to go take care of that. But when the engine light comes on in my body, I ignore it. Look at the circumstances, even in your life with your children. Your children start going awry. Begin, don't just chastise them. Begin to look at yourself as you, their children are a mirror to you. Keep your eyes, walk with your eyes open. God will use circumstances to get your attention. Number two, bad choices can be avoided. Bad choices can be avoided. What you will do is divinely known. God already knows. From an eternity perspective, your choices are a done deal. But it's your choice what you do in your life. Choose wisely. Choose wisely. Some choices you can bounce back from. I was, I was considering the story of, of uh, Peter and, and Judas, you know, when, when Jesus was uh, going through that trial and, and how Peter denied Jesus and he was able to bounce back. But Judas betrayed Jesus and he was not able to bounce back. Some of your choices you can bounce back from. Some of your choices cannot be escaped in this life. Choose wisely. Number three, journeys cannot be avoided. Where you came from, where you are, where you're going. It's just, it's just your journey. It can't be avoided. You can affect them by choices, but it's your journey. Trust God. Trust the journey. And don't look too far ahead. Don't look too far ahead at all. If you consider even the concept of God ordering your footsteps, what do you need to be watching? Your footsteps. A, a lamp unto my feet. That's, we don't have to be looking way out in the future. Deal with what's before you, what God is walking you through and the future will take care of itself. Learn how to encourage yourself. Don't be afraid to stand alone. In fact, embrace your alone time. To, to meet whatever our issues, sometimes we just have to be around people, have to be around people. Get away from those people. Oftentimes the people will lead you astray. Man, when I was doing this for those 17 years at juvenile detention center ministry, most of the kids in there were not bad. Most of them had just hooked up with somebody that was bad and just got drug into situations with them. It's not bad to stand alone. Learn to stand alone. Embrace your alone time because that's where you can tune your ear to that still, small voice that speaks to you. That voice is God. Stay the course. Number five, don't deviate from what you know is right, but be open for correction. We often deviate. David deviated. Why in the world would he think it would be okay to go seek out and live with the Philistines? Why in the world would he think it would be okay to fight with the Philistines against his own people? Don't deviate from what you know is right, because all it will bring you is trouble. Number six, God is your source. It does matter how you appropriate what God has promised. Now, I'm sharing with you what I know. I'm sharing with you what we do. You know, if a door closes, don't get the crowbar to try to open it up. That's God closing that door. We, we sometimes make things happen that shouldn't happen. Don't do that. No man can close a door that God has opened. No man can open a door that God has closed. Even you, but God will give you leeway. And in that leeway, even as we find in the life of David, there, there can be heartbreak. It's always best just to fall in line with what God is doing. And number seven, after the press, there is something you will now be able to do that before the press, you couldn't. I've shared with you my life right here. I shared with you what I live by. This is, sometimes you look at an individual and you say, man, I wish I got what he got. I wish I got what she got. But, but the journey, <laughs> the journey isn't difficult. The journey just takes a made up mind. That, that I'm not going to be swayed. I'm not going to move to the left. I'm not going to move to the right. I'm just going to continue. That's the journey. 
And, and I'm telling you, God will take you a particular way for a purpose to become what you need to be. I shared with you my story, even with the post office. Now, for, So for 25 years, I carried mail. 20 miles a day I walked. I'm going to be 62 in a couple of months. So, so what has happened with this degree, this degree and, and my health came at the same time. Okay, this is just simply walking in the path that God has chosen. I'm, I'm just saying, so what I've given you at the press, after the press, there's going, to be, there's going to be something that you'll now be able to do that before the press you couldn't, and I'm, I'm that proof. So this morning, I didn't have a joke for you. <laughs> I was trying to come up with one this morning, but it just wasn't happening. Because to me, I guess I have a couple of minutes here. To me, when we look around our, our land, the situation of the land that we live in today and even the world, we recognize that there are a lot of problems. We recognize that even as believers, we're sort of polarized against each other, trying to find the right way to go. Uh, so we're looking at the political situation, we're looking at the religious situation, we're looking at the world. There's so many choices that we have that we can make, and the lines have become blurred upon what is right and what is wrong. And so it's not our fault. I mean, we're just human beings trying to survive in a very limited time we have on this planet. And, and so what I'm just sharing is there, is there was like a compass. There was like a way to recalibrate, to try to find our way back to where we're supposed to be. There are folks that, you know, I wish, you know, even as our senior pastor says, I wish things would be like, back like they were, but they weren't good for everybody. All, all we have is today. All we have is today is find the proper way. And why it's important is because we have children. We have children that are watching us. It, it's, it's important, more important for me, even like with my education, I'm limited on what I could do with this MBA. Okay, if I had done it when I was 25, it'd be a big different story. But, but, I, but I look at my daughter here so I can be an example and say this is how important an education is. So, so the lives that we live today and the choices that we're making today, it may not be that pertinent to our individual lives as older people, but there are a lot of young people that are watching us to try to determine the direction that they should go. And that's why it's important. That's why it's important for, for parents to, to be there, to be present. It's, a, it's important for us to live a life, an example, how we would want our kids. I had a buddy, even at the post office, that he was so, exa he was so angry because his son had smoked weed. He had been telling his son for years, don't smoke weed, don't smoke weed, don't smoke weed. But, but he was drinking a beer every night after work. And, and, and so to his son, his son, he just validated the buzz. His son just chose what kind. We have to be careful what, we're, what messages we're sending to our children. So, so, so I'm just sharing with you because we look at the life of David here. And the reason I chose David, because David's a very important character in the Bible. We love King David, right? How he killed Goliath and all that. David was a mess. He made all kinds of mistakes. Bathsheba slept with the ladies, you find, bathing on the had her husband killed and ended up marrying her. He was doing all kinds of stuff like that, and his kids became a terrible mess. One of his sons raped his, his sister, and the other son went to kill him, and, and it was a big mess. Another son came against David and was end up, you know, getting killed himself. So, so David wasn't all that. Scripture tells us that David was a man after God's own heart, and he was. We love God. But the reality is our, our lives, the lives we live, do have an effect on the little eyes that are watching us. Okay? Man, man, I've seen it. The mailman, I think God chose this thing. I mean, come on, I came out of corporate America, three-piece suit. Five months later, I was a mailman. God chose that path for me to see what I could see in the communities. Man, man I, see, I see kids, man. I was living in Dunbar High School. That was my area. So I, I would see kids coming out of school. I'd see little girls, boys, boys choking the girl, their little girlfriends. And they all thought it was funny. But where did that boy learn that from? Where did the girl learn that it was Okay. So, so I'm saying is everything that we do has an effect. And, and I'm just suggesting here that we just, is this whole message is, is, is really not that complicated. I mean, I had to fill up 40, 45 minutes, but it's not that complicated. Just do the right thing. Trust God. Allow God to, to, to author your footsteps and recognize that, that, that your actions have consequences. That's the message. I guess I could have just said that, right? But, but read about David sometime. Don't just, you know, we come to church and we'll hear a message or watch it on TV or whatever about David. And there are nice little stories about David all through Scripture. 
But, but if these stories are really going to affect us, this isn't even the Word of God if it doesn't have any real effect in our lives. We need to read this, but read it with an open mind. Walk with your eyes open and begin to check for yourself and check your own life. You'll be all right. That's, that's what I've come to share with you today. The conclusion is that David was okay in the end, but he created a lot of turmoil, a lot of mess, a lot of broken heart, and a lot of lost lives in the process. Okay? So, so this morning we've witnessed David in the valley. We observed how he got there. We got to see how God preserved him in the valley and how God brought him out. Now you may be in a valley of your own creation or a valley created by someone else. Or God may be ordering your footsteps through a valley for a greater destiny. Whatever your reason, my mandate is to bring you out of that darkness, to help some of you avoid the darkness that might be on your horizon, and to prepare some of you for a darkness that you may be forced to experience. But, but if you'll first bow your heads for a moment, if there, is anyone, if there is anyone you already know, the desire you have is your spirit yearning, beckoning to make a decision to commit to a brighter path. If that is you, raise your hand. Raise your hand. If I see a hand, I see another hand. Repeat this prayer after me. And not out loud. Just repeat this prayer to yourself. That still small voice, that God within you, just pray to yourself, but repeat after me. Father, take me as I am. Forgive me for my sin. Open my eyes to understanding. Allow me to begin to see myself as you see me. Take everything out of me that is not like Christ. Fill me with your spirit and let your anointing rest upon me in Jesus' name. All right, you now have an understanding of the valley of the shadow of death, defeating it, avoiding it, and preparing for it. At the end of the service, come up front and we'll agree with you in prayer to step out of that darkness, to avoid unnecessary darkness, and to be mentally, emotionally, and spiritually ready for whatever God has planned for your evolving perfection. Amen.